This is a production of Cornell University. Hi, this is Sarah Zaragoza Smith, uh, and I'd like to introduce the person who I'm recording. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, my name is Bob Derrig. All right, welcome, uh, Bob Derrig. I'm so happy to be getting to record this with you. I'd love to start by just asking you to explain, you know, how you got started working with lichens. How did you become a lichenologist? Okay, it's an interest. I think it's an interesting story. First of all, because I know very few people who are lichenologists, and they all have a story, and it's a, it's an unusual specialization. So it has an interesting history always. And actually, I think I also, before I actually get to the details, I want to talk about how art connects to science in this. And in my case, uh, I, when, and I'm interested in various aspects of biology. One of them is lichens, obviously. Another is lepidoptera, butterflies and moths. And the third is vascular plants. And there are other things. This birds was another early, early uh, interest as well and remains so. But uh, in several of the cases, I had a charismatic event when I was a kid that uh, just imprinted on me how wonderful these different sorts of organisms are. And I was attracted to their beauty and just so gorgeous or the forms, you know, the colors, the combinations and so on. And an example from entomology is the luna moth, which is about Six, six inches long with big long tails and the wings. It's bright green and it has a pure white body and uh, lavender touches on the wings. And when I was five years old, my, both of my grandmothers found one and showed it to me that year. One was on a, on a tomato plant. And you know, I, being a kid, I reached for it and went off into the trees, this big, you know, just absolutely gorgeous. And then uh, the other one, my, my other grandmother found on a path between our house and theirs, uh, lying on the ground. And she got it on her finger and took it up to, she took it up to her house and put it on a, a curtain in the dining room. And we all went up and oohed and odd. So that made a big impression on me that I didn't realize until later. But that, that's what I mean by a charismatic uh, Interaction now with lichens, a similar thing happened about a year later, and uh, it was when I went to visit my cousins Nancy and Kathy, who lived half and half a mile from our house. And Nancy was in my grade in school; we were about the same age, and Kathy a year older. And their father was a naturalist who grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And in his youth, he had a predilection for beetles, and uh, he he had nice glass cases, glass top wooden cases with foam on the bottom, but for the pins to go in. And uh, over the decades, he found that his beetle collection had been eaten up by other smaller beetles. So uh, the girls and he went out. Uh, they lived on a hundred acre old farm. And it was actually our great grandfather's colonial farm. And uh, uh, it was about 200 acres, I think, and they had, uh, it was old fields and stuff that were success, succeeding vegetationally. And in that kind of situation, uh, there are certain pot lichen pioneers that come in, and they had found some very pretty big clumps of things. And they were very excited about it. I think there had been a, an article in the New York State Conservationist magazine that we all got from, it's from what's now called DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation. And they, uh, it had a center spread on lichens, and so they went out and tried to see what they could find. And then they brought them home, and my uncle Bob said, let's go up and get one of my insect cases and make an exhibit in them, or a little display. So they put big clumps of these things on the white bottom of the case and polished it all up, having gotten rid of the forest of dead pins and stuff that were in there. And so uh, 
I, we came, we went down to visit, and they dragged me into the living room where this thing was enshrined on the table in the corner. And, and it's Bobby, Bobby, come and look and see what this is, see this lichen thing. And I'd never heard of a lichen before at age five. And, uh, and so I just stood there and stared at this thing. And every, and it was on the, in the living room for like, like, uh, weeks and weeks. And so every time I was down there, I was, uh, I was going in and looking at it. So again, a charismatic event, I wasn't aware of how important it would be later, but that's how I became interested in lichens, by seeing them and seeing how beautiful they were. And always in my case, at least, the, the, the aesthetic aspect of it appealed to me. And then I asked scientific questions. What is it? You know, like insects, what do they feed on? Things like that. So anyway, I think that theme is interesting. So I, I wanted a, a, a lichen collection like that. And my dad was in the lumbering business and out a lot in the outdoors all the time and used to find things. But we didn't have an old farm with all of the old field stuff. And I was confined to the yard because we lived by a big road. And so it wasn't possible for me to go out and explore and find my own until a few years later when I... I finally had uh, the ability to go all over our property and others nearby, and, and so I started bringing pieces of lichens home to me. And then uh, I, I was about 16, I think, when I put together a, a very similar thing to what we'd had when we were kids to look at and enjoy. And uh, I did it through the Aegis of 4-H, it was something I could exhibit at a fair and get a prize on. And so, so that was sort of fun. And a few years later, uh, it had, they fade if they're in light. So it, and it may have disintegrated in other ways. But um, a, a few years later, I just disbanded it. But one of the things that I kept was a specimen of uh, what they call an Easter like, and it's genus Stereocolon. And it's something that grows on rocks. And it had been collected in a different uncle's uh, pasture. And there were outcrops of rocks in it. And the rocks were there. And there were no livestock. And so it was on the rocks. And I went back to find it again before I took the case apart and realized it was gone because they'd gotten Herefords, I think, something like that, that was eating it. So um, I kept that piece. And later when we do something with visual, I can show it to you. I picked, pulled it out this afternoon. Um, so that, that is sort of the trajectory of being interested in and renewing interest. Then at Cornell, when I came here to study entomology and environmental education as an undergrad, I took a class that was uh, taught by Richard Fisher uh, called Field Natural History, which was one of the most magical things I ever took as a class here. Of course, I was resonating with the subject matter already, but it was wonderful to, to do this. And he spent a week on lichens, including an hour-long lecture and a three-hour lab. And we walked around the campus at Round BB Lake and other places on campus, and he pointed out all the lichens, and he sat in the lab when we got back and showed how to do spot tests, which are used in, uh, in identifying them by scraping a little bit of the, the top of the lichen off and putting a chemical like Clorox on it. And if it makes a pretty color, like red usually with that, uh, it means it has a certain uh, chemical that it manufactures inside the thallus. So um, I was realized years later that I actually had seen him demonstrate this, but it wasn't until several years after I, uh, I had left this, this stage that I, I actually was doing that kind of thing. And uh, we had, um, in the meantime, uh, in 1975, I uh, had start, decided I, wanted, I had been involved in uh, writing curatorial information about insect collections for, through my first job here, which was running the 4-H entomology program for the state. 
And so I was interested in biological collections. I'd been pressing plants since I was a kid also, particularly flowers and trees and reeds and things like that, again through 4-H projects. I, as I said, I decided to, uh, to start an, uh, an herbarium. And so I was doing this in October, and the, flop, the leaves had all fallen off, and, and the, the green vegetation had been uh, ruined by frost, so you could see the landforms and you could see rocks and trees and stuff, so that all the, the, the lichens and mosses and other cryptogams showed up that were hidden by the foliage. And so my 10-year-old brother, Matthew, was with me the day that I actually started to collect, and we went into this wonderful swamp about 1,400 feet down the road from where my parents lived, where we lived. And uh, we, uh, we collected all of the things that were evergreen. So I had evergreen ferns and rhododendron and mountain laurel and a few other things like that. And then I remembered that up on a cliff... Uh, there was uh, another kind of fern called a polypody that lived there. And uh, this one, was, it, it's the kind of thing that grows on rocks and big sheets over the, over the rock. And the other, these other things were wetland plants. So I went up there, and we were on a 45-degree slope, and it had outcrops of, of the bluestone sandstone that's so famous from there, and a talus slope going down. And there was an old logging road down at the bottom, the Jeep trail kind of thing. And so while we were up there, uh, a gunshot rang out. And we had uh, a day that was very, very foggy, so you couldn't see very far ahead of you, like four or five feet maybe. And uh, so I, I, yelled to, uh, I yelled and said, we're up here, please stop shooting. A voice came from down down the hill saying, "Hey, sorry, we didn't know you were there. You know, so we'll stop shooting." And uh, so we came down, and I said we were fine, you know. And then we came down the slope sort of quickly, and because it was raining, we both had. I'd given my brother a man's black umbrella for his birthday when he was ten years old, so. I had one of my own because it was raining and we were sort of collecting under this, this rain shadow. So we ended up plummeting into the road, plunk, plunk, with, with two umbrellas. <laughs> we see these, th this hunter and his son across the road from us, you know, um, with uh, rifles and akimbo and angles of their arms and looking at these interesting people that just showed up. And so... Uh, it was a little, it was a little uh, strange, and he said, "He said, hey, sorry, didn't know you were there." And uh, I, rep I replied, "You couldn't, you couldn't have seen us in this fog anyway. It's okay, we're fine." And then uh, he volunteered, "I'm teaching my boy how to shoot before deer season. We're uh, we're up from New Jersey for the weekend." And then he sort of looks at me and expects me to, what are you doing? You know, and I said, oh, we're, we're looking for mosses, lichens, and ferns. <laughs> and uh, I was just showing my brother some common polypody, and the kid says, common what? <laughs> With a challenge in his voice. I said, polypody, it's a fern that grows on rocks. Uh, what are you doing with them? What's that other stuff, molds, fungus? No, uh, molds, I, and the kid says, molds, I hate that stuff. It gets all over the bathroom. No, 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 they're mosses, lichens, and ferns. And we're making a collection. And he says, oh, but why? What good are they? What good are they? Why bother? And weary of the interview, uh, realizing the futility of trying to explain further, and possessed of an imp, I have never regretted. I looked him in the eye, shrugged my shoulders, and, and declared, why, we're just batty botanists. And twirling my umbrella, I skipped off into the fog, and my brother follows me, who's quite imitative, and the childish glee that he, he was uh, making must have rung somewhat eerily on the misty wilderness scene. <laughs> So we just got out of sight and we peeked around a tree trunk. <laughs> and 
they're they're standing there sort of shell-shocked and saying, uh, come on, Joe, let's get out of here. And the, and the boy says, yes, Dad, the wood is full of, woods is full of crazies. <laughs> anyway, that was an interesting beginning for it. But this is done within the context. I mean, it's a funny story, but the context of this was beginning in herbarium. And that was important for... Uh, uh, for me, because it it uh, it was a milestone in my life, similar to when I began an insect collection when I was in about tenth grade, and uh, the the lichens became an important focus, the most important focus for a while, in, in episodes anyway. After that, and uh, uh, it, it actually resulted in a long, a long, long, long quest for knowledge and names, particularly of these, because there were no really good, hardly any, I don't think there were any field guides to lichens at that time, and they were very difficult. This is in the mid-70s now. They were very difficult to identify uh, because of, and also difficult to illustrate because they're very intricate, very small, and three-dimensional, and so they had a lot of, uh, uh, it, it was just difficult to draw them. I tried to draw them myself, and I, I had limited success. If they were, it was a fat, flat folio species that was easy, but some of the reindeer lichens that are, you know, three-dimensional, you need two inches of focus if you're trying to take photographs of them, for example. They're very challenging even today with the better cameras and, and other methods that we have to do that. So um, I plotted along for a few years, and uh, it took it took a long time to uh, find somebody to realize that I needed a teacher. I'd hit plateaus that I, I couldn't do things above that and just hit plateaus in certain aspects of lichenology. And I, it, it's really true that learning about lichens is difficult, lonely, and frustrating, especially for a beginner. And most of the popular books that were available in that era uh, presented lichens in a formal taxonomic style that wasn't that was intimidating to novices and uh, uh, not at all charismatic. Uh, and of course, accurately named lichen collections are hard to find anywhere. There are there are some of there's some around, but they're they're more unusual than I mean, plant herbaria are pretty common, and and plants are much easier to identify usually, but but uh, it's hard to uh, to do this in isolation. So. Um, when we finally find another lichenologist, it's surprising how catalytic the contact can be. And in fact, lichenology seems to require cooperative learning in a uh, in, in a, order to gain even a partial mastery over the wide variety of lichens that occur in most almost any region. And I think in the meantime, a checklist of New York lichens has come out that is over 800 species. Most of them are crustos. The big pretties are by which I mean fruticose and folios and umbilicate, are, uh, are maybe two or three hundred. Uh, so uh, in, in 1994, skipping almost 20 years ahead from, from the hunter encounter, uh, after 20 years of snow, slow progress on my own, I was privileged to add in a, in a to attend an inaugural meeting of one of these groups, at, called, and it was called a Tuckerman Lichen Workshop, organized by Richard C. Harris of the New York Botanical Garden, which he named in honor of Edward Tuckerman, who was a pioneer American lichenologist. <clears throat> and his vision was to train a core of sophisticated amateur people who could carry out effective field efforts with lichens that would complement and extend the work of our very few salaried American lichenologists could do. It was a wonderful group of people. And at, at the first meeting, about a dozen serious amateurs from throughout the northeastern United States convened for several days in the Catskill Mountains uh, of New York, where we shared field collecting and laboratory study of them at night and for about six days. 
And with Dick as our mentor, and the camaraderie and the excitement were wonderful, and the natural setting was attractive, the accommodations were great, and best of all, we learned a great deal from each other. So uh, this first workshop was so stimulating that we begged for more. Over the intervening, intervening dozen years, Dick, aided by uh, the bryologist from the New York BG, has kindly offered many additional workshops to lichenologically rich uh, locales from Nova Scotia to Florida and west of Missouri's Ozarks. Uh, in the process, uh, the people who attended uh, have enjoyed field and laboratory experiences with several hundred species of eastern North American lichens, and we met most of the lichenologists of this massive region as a result, because they would come to these things too. Um, we had organized ourselves into uh, an organization, a loose organization called Eastern Lichen Network, and some members have undertaken, even undertaken floristic and taxonomic pro projects. Uh, they've the, the workshops have matured into a vital arena for collaborative field inventories, inspiration, and honing of our lichenological knowledge through out eastern North America. And they're still continuing. I think there's, they're, they're doing the 40th or 50th one this year. It's in, I can't remember where I just got the, the notice for it. It's somewhere in, in, I think it's in the Great Smokies maybe, I'm not sure. It's somewhere in the Southeast. So I, in the meantime, my, my journey with lichens has, has matured with, with all of this information and finally having a group of people with whom I can interact and, uh, and, and ask questions of has been uh, the key to, to becoming a much better lichenologist. And my herbarium in the meantime has grown to about 4,000 <laughs> specimens, much to my surprise. And uh, most of them are identified, at least the genus, which is even more surprising. But I, I, I struggle with crusts a bit, but it's mostly because they require a lot of work and, they, and, and microtome sections and high micro, microscopy and so forth. But there's much better literature today as well. So we have some wonderful uh, uh, guides that are available right now. In fact, it, this this spring, I think it was, or winter, a new book called Urban Lichens, a Field Guide for Northeastern North America by someone from the New York Botanical Garden and, and another uh, person who's from Washington State, I think. Uh, it's on lichens of urban areas. They're actually, with, with lessening of air pollution, they're finding that they're colonizing trees in parks and streets and stuff like that. And th they... They've provided color images of all the all the lichens known from New York City, and the area covered uh, is from Boston and Toronto and Ottawa, and all the way down to D.C. and then west to Chicago. So it's and and then they're wonderfully done. The crusts are illustrated very beautifully, and they have practical information. It's really a, a very admirable book. The other one that is most helpful for New York and New England is uh, the Macro Lichens of New England, which was published in 2007 by Wood. It's wonderful that, you know, this fraternity, sorority of people who, who are interested in it. And I, I'm finding, to my, my delight, that more and more people are learning them and know, because it's more accessible now. And the Internet, of course, helps. So it's a, it's a big... It's a big field, and it's, uh, it's a complicated one, but it's one that's absolutely wonderful and joyous. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.